Hey, Barry. Hey, Al. What mountain do players scale to gain a level? I don't know. Experience point. It's time for Compelled Duel. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Compelled Duel. I'm Al. And I'm Barry. And we are a single-player, co-DM'd D&D 5e actual play podcast. Previously on Compelled Duel. You hear from the door a metallic rattle. Well, shit fire, I guess this thing is really stuck. All right, stud, do your thing. Hey, long time no see. A lot of stuff has changed. Uh, the world's on fire. I thought you died for a bit. I figured out that I also like men now. Someone will have heard that, so we need to get all of you out of bondage and (laughs) fucking move. I'll be damned. He did do it, huh? Yeah, he really did. My brother and I have good reason to believe that our father killed his and your brother, Valoran, for the purpose of extending the Vuldurin War. Oh my god! It occurs to me I may have uh, forgotten to add something to our conversation on the train. Don't worry about it. I'm capable of basic inferencing. Something, something, you were better off before you met me. Something, something, I ruined your life. I was gonna say I love you too, actually. I am so sorry to interrupt, dear. Um, the Archduchess is here to see you. The who? In the hallway outside, you hear the click of high heels on the tile. Closely followed by the offbeat percussion of a cane. The Archduchess of Australia, Elasha Dakarin, looks from your uncle to your aunt to you, nods grimly and says, All right, well, it seems we all need to talk. We open up right where we left off with Fee. You are standing in your Aunt Nora's study with your aunt, your uncle Aaron, and the woman who raised you. Elasha Dakarin is standing in the doorway, long, magnificent gown trailing behind her, a gleaming circlet on her head, and has just been reintroduced to you as the Archduchess of Australia. You see your Aunt Nora's grip around her wine glass go white-knuckled, and she stands up and moves to go sit behind her desk. She looks over at your uncle and goes, Aaron, sweetie, we are being terrible hosts right now. How about you go downstairs and get the kids and our new guests and take them out for some evening entertainment, maybe to the night market. Your uncle frowns at her. Is that what we need to really be worrying about right now? And she cuts him off. Of course it is. I would hate to appear rude, so maybe you should just go get all of them and take them somewhere outside the house, Aaron. He then gets the picture and nods shakily before turning to Alasha, dipping a little bow. Your Majesty? And fucking books it. He's down the hall, gone. Nora is still sitting behind her desk. She has not moved, and Alasha hasn't either. Fee grits her teeth and reaches up to touch her fingers to the base of her neck gives a very wide, very strained smile and says, Archduchess, how wonderful to see you after all these months. Ilasha sweeps into the room, sets her cane down next to one of the armchairs and reaches up to get your face in both of her hands. 
She hooks one finger under the streak of your hair that has gone white after your incident with the lightning strike and looks deeply saddened. Oh, thank Kimrel, you're all right. What's happened to you? And then she seems to remember herself and takes a step back, picks her cane back up, and turns over to Nora. Nora, I know this is going to sound a little odd, but as a favor to an old battle buddy, would you perhaps mind not discussing Ferora's arrival with anybody for now? Your Aunt Nora laughs with absolutely no humor in it and stands up from behind her desk very sharply. <laughs> oh, that horse has left the barn, Alasha. Believe me, the first thing I did was reach out to Boreas and Jorana with a lot of the new information that I have learned today. Elasha smiles at her very tightly, and you have known her long enough to see the threat that is lying just beneath the surface of it. Well, in that case, if you wouldn't mind giving us the room, I have some things to discuss with my stepdaughter. Nora's lips press into a very thin line, and without displaying any courtly decorum or civility, she just shoves back from her desk and stalks around it and goes to the door. She stops in the doorway and turns back to Yuffie. Fine. Ferora, if you need anything, I will be right outside. All you have to do is call for me. And she walks out and slams the door behind her. There is a long beat of silence following her exit, during which you feel the little ping of a sending spell go off in your head and you hear your brother's voice. Uncle Aaron's rushing us out of the house. I get the feeling this is an evacuation. Where are you? What's going on? Fee sends back. Elasha is here. I'm handling it. Start thinking of a plan. In front of you, you see Elasha's very composed, regal posture that she had adopted when talking to your aunt cave in a little bit, and she winces, reaches down to rub at her hip, and sits down in one of the wingback chairs in front of the fireplace. All right, so we'll need to eventually unpack the mystery of how you managed to survive, but for now we have a lot of other catching up to do. Yes, it seems we do. Fee steps a little closer and just hisses, What the fuck are you doing? She narrows her eyes at you. What I have to do, and mind your tone. <laughs> you, you knew what he was, and you married him, and you want me to watch my tone? My tone is the issue here, Alasha. Really? One could make the argument that he also knew what I was and married me, but that is irrelevant. Yes, I did. It was the best method to secure enough power to help me find out the truth of everything that's going on, and to secure your position once you eventually made it home. I have been in your corner for your entire life, Ferrora, but now that support actually has some power behind it. This is you being in my corner. Marrying the man that fucked with my mind, being complicit in a baseless war, sending defiance after me as an attack dog, that's being in my corner? She gets to her feet. She gets up in your face a little bit. This war is not baseless. Crack open a history book, Fee. For hundreds of years, Vogvoldor has been getting bigger and hungrier, and if somebody doesn't nip that ambition in the bud, they will swallow the entire world. As for the situation with your father, if I had known more about what was going on, then I maybe could have done something to mitigate it, but I... Morlin has a long and storied history of acting rashly when backed into a corner. And as for Defiance, we had no way of knowing about all of that nasty business in Pearlport. She was just supposed to collect you and bring you home safely. Although in retrospect, that could be my fault. I should have known. 
even as far back as the beginning of the Beacon Schism, Defiance proved herself to be a loose cannon who took the orders that she was given extremely liberally. Orders that she was... <laughs> of course, you had the Javaris is killed. That makes sense. She reels back a little bit, looking shocked. I... I how do you know about... Uh, that's irrelevant. Listen, Fee, I see where you're coming from with this. I know you want to protect Leo, but you can't. He has proven time and time again that he will not content himself to play a long game, and he will not fall in line. There is no saving him. Please, just come home. We can fix this. We can be a family. Fee takes a step back from her. A family? I have a family. I have people that know me well enough to know that I wouldn't take that offer, and that love me enough that they wouldn't make it. I... <laughs> a family. That's what you've been thinking that you've been pursuing? That's the reason you've had so many people killed? Or let them die? And Fee just, like, starts ticking off on her fingers. Soren, his parents, the family of someone that I love very much. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if my uncle and Leo's mother are on the list. And every person that is going to die in this war that you are helping my father manufacture. If this is what you being in my corner looks like, I would rather stand alone. This woman, for all intents and purposes, is your mother. I would like you to roll an insight check with advantage. I'm going to use a reroll off the gift of the Stormbringer. I'm going to use a second one. That one's a natural 19. So it's an 18 because I have negative one to insight. But still. When you mention your uncle and Leo's mother... You watch Elasha react in a very strange way. You level these accusations at her, and you see her eyes go up to the family portrait hanging over Nora's fireplace in the study, leveling on the face of a young Valor and Valsine. Then she looks down at where there is a magnificent wedding ring around her finger. She looks back up at you. And for a moment, she looks deeply afraid. And in that moment, you realize that you have called her out on a couple of secrets that she thought nobody knew about. As you are having this realization, the door to the study bursts open behind you. Leo comes running in with Zed and Eleonora hot on his heels, and your Aunt Nora reaching out for them from the doorway as if she was trying to stop them. Leo skids to a halt, right next to where you and Alasha are standing in front of the fireplace, raises his eyebrows, and goes, <laughs> You know, my uncle mentioned that the Archduchess was here, and I was wondering who had dug up my mother's corpse and dragged it all the way to Vogvoldur, but I see what the situation is now. Elasha looks over at him with a very distasteful expression and goes, Shortly after you disappeared, your mother unfortunately took ill and died under the custody of the priesthood on Luxtogallen. And Leo just throws his head back and laughs. <laughs> that is such a load of horse shit, Elasha. A more subtle version of that fearful look that you just saw her have crosses her face briefly, and then she stomps it down, puts the Archduchess mask right back on. You know, this is all your fault, right? You could have just signed the papers, lived a comfortable life out in the countryside with your fiancé. Or if not that, you could have at least had the decency to die when you were supposed to. But now we're all here, so great job, Leiril. Without missing a beat, Fee snaps, I think you should leave. We have nothing else to say to each other. Elasha turns over to you with this look of utter desperation. 
I came here with a peaceful solution, Fee. The path that I am offering is the one of mercy. Please, think it over. And then she picks up her cane, turns on her heel, and walks out of the study. There is a long, silent moment where all of you are just standing around looking at each other. And then Leo lunges forward and hugs you super hard. (sighs) You scared the shit out of me. I'm so glad you're okay. Fee hugs him back and says, You dumbass, I said I had it handled. She wasn't gonna hurt me. And I wasn't going to just leave you alone. And he kind of turns to look at your aunt and survey the situation going on in this room after Alasha has left. Oh, fuck, things are bad, aren't they? Well, they're certainly not good. I... And Fee reaches up and, like, pinches the bridge of her nose. I I don't know what we do from here. I I don't know. (sighs) They know we're in the city. They know where we're staying. Your Aunt Nora steps into the room, into the middle of this conversation, and puts both hands up. I understand that everybody is very stressed right now, but this is a conversation for tomorrow. You all look like you haven't rested in days. And I can promise you safety under my roof, if nothing else. The information that you are both alive is already out there. There is nothing that anybody can do to stop it. And if Morlin wants to try to come here and get you himself... She turns her head over to where her armor and her sword are still in the open cabinet on the wall. And her jaw sets very hard. I wish he would. I wish he would try. Everybody, try to decompress the best you can. Go lay down. We will figure this out in the morning, okay? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And Fee just kind of breaks a hand back through her hair and goes, Right, there's nothing we can do. There's never nothing we can do, Ferrara. Go to bed. Try to rest. Uh, send... Adra, in. Before you do, I need to talk to her about the security system on the house. Will do. Uh, thank you. And Fee's gonna walk out. And get Adra, apparently. You and Leo both leave, walk downstairs. You find Adra in the foyer, kind of gathered with everybody else, looking just as confused as the rest of them. You direct her up to her mother's study. You see her roll off down the hallway towards the elevator. And everybody else heads back upstairs for the night. You see Leo and Zed peel off into their room together. Ravane and a Verity, who is more subdued than you have ever seen her, go off into their room. Everybody starts bunking down for the night. And then coming up from behind you, you feel two sets of fingers lace between yours and close around both of your hands. On your left, the captain tilts his head and frowns at you a little bit. You all right there, lass? (laughs) Uh, as all right as I'm going to be. On your other side, Sabine squeezes at your hand and reaches up to pet your hair back from your face. And that's the best that any of us can ask for. I think we should all go to bed. Yeah, uh... I'll discuss the things that I learned tonight with the two of you in the morning, I suppose. Honestly, I... I am exhausted. I'm... I'm... I'm I'm just gonna lay down. And Fee just kind of pulls her hands out of both their grips and goes to the room and goes to take her trance. Leo, I would think it takes you a bit to settle down after that adrenaline rush. But nonetheless, you have managed to get a full night's trance by the time that You are roused from your semi-conscious state by the rapid weight redistribution of Zed getting off the bed next to you and the mattress bouncing back. He opens his eyes and sits up. 
Zed winces when he sees that he's woken you up and just grimacing goes, if we're doing this, you should know that I haven't slept past 7 a.m. unless I was like actively dying since I was about eight. And I can try to stay in bed, but I get bored. Leo sits up with absolutely atrocious bedhead and squints over at him, but then relaxes back against the headboard and smiles. And you should know that I haven't gotten out of bed before 10 a.m. without an entire pot of coffee since I was about 40. But I'm willing to compromise if it means that we get to keep doing this. Zed grins and, like, reaches up to wrap the back of his neck and goes, Coffee I can do. And he holds out a hand to you. Leo takes his hand and gets up and gets ready for the day. Your party had a difficult day yesterday. (laughs) So everybody else is still in their rooms by the time you get downstairs. So the only person that is in your aunt's dining room is your cousin Lark who is just doing tarot spreads next to a plate that appears to be just muffins with, like, an attempt at, like, an apple wedge so they can say that they're not just eating muffins for breakfast. Leo just pauses and leans in the doorway. Morning, Lark. Uh, do you know where a guy could get some fucking caffeine around here? Lark looks up, immediately flashes a big grin. It's been a bit of an adjustment reintroducing yourself to them like adra is pretty much the same but there's a certain level where ashurian nobility even children especially boys are expected to be very reserved and very quiet and you remember lark being extremely in the background extremely silent and they are not that now (laughs) they flash you this big grin and then very chipperly say oh yeah adra brewed ridiculously strong coffee this morning uh she didn't trance i would go get it for you but and they flip another card i'm doing tarot spreads to see if your dad's gonna bust it and kill all of us so i'm focusing <laughs> <laughs> leo blinks at them for a second and then goes you know what that is so valid of you i'm gonna and then Goes off to find coffee. Yeah, Zed's gonna go with you. You get the sense he is not super comfortable being left alone with your relatives. You walk into the kitchen. The coffee pot is not hard to find. There is an odor (laughs) emanating from it. I'm gonna pour myself a cup and take a very cautious sip. It is like gasoline. It is rocket fuel. (laughs) This is the strongest, most bitter, most burnt-tasting coffee you've ever tasted in your life. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, alright, yep, milk, milk, milk and sugar. As you are desperately searching for milk and sugar to put in your coffee, the back door from the kitchen pops open, and there is a clatter as Adra slides in. She's not in the chair, she's got her leg braces on and she's on crutches and she's got a bag that is making metallic rattling noises that are a bit ominous on her back she looks at you nods and says if you empty the coffee pot i request that you refill it (coughs) if i refill it i'll do it with something better than whatever the fuck you put in there god she blinks owlishly she has like dark dark circles under her eyes right now i didn't put anything special in it i just double brewed it Uh, yeah well it served its intended purpose it woke me up why have you been up all night adra sighs swings herself over and hops up on the counter and just starts like absently rubbing at one of her thighs and goes well you see mother mentioned that we might have issues with certain people trying to breach our secure perimeter around the house and that we might require a little more firepower than usual out of the security system. So I was up all night beefing up the wards, extending the perimeter a little bit, trying to make sure that there are no weak spots and making sure that what we do have is strong enough to take out a fully grown dire wolf 
And then she pulls a thermos out of her bag and grabs the coffee pot from you and refills it as she says, I know Uncle Marlin's powerful, but I mean, I'm good. She takes a long swig of the coffee that she just poured into her thermos. No milk, no sugar, straight faced. That's very kind of you to put all that work in, Adra. Thank you. Do we know if we have any other measures put in place to figure out what's happening next, or are we just playing a defensive game at this point? Adra takes another swig of her coffee. I mean, not to be rude, but I have no idea because I was up all night and you walked into my house unannounced. As she's saying that, there is the sound of footsteps on the stairs. And Verity rushes into the kitchen with Ravain on her heels. She pauses long enough to grin at you, Zed and Adra, and say, Hi, sorry to rush out. Um, We have to grab breakfast or we're going to be late. And she just starts grabbing like random food stuffs like fruit, half a loaf of bread, and just like stuffing them in a rucksack. Leo watches her do this, turns over to Ravain, and goes, Nah, no problem. Where are you two headed? Ravain reaches up to, like, blearily rub at one of his eyes and coughs up a small cloud of spores into his hand and then says, <clears throat> uh, important intel gathering mission into the city. Behind you on the counter, Adra says, they're going on a bus tour. I got them tickets last night. My girlfriend has a hookup at the transit agency. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Be careful out there. I hope you have fun. Just remember how many people want all of us dead. Verity ties her rucksack closed and goes, Thanks! They mostly want you dead, so I think we're gonna be okay. Have a great day, though! Yeah, you know, Verity? Surprisingly, you're right. Really? Awesome! She stops to give you a big bear hug and Zed a big bear hug. Zed makes a kind of uncomfortable noise, like, huh? and pats her on the back a couple times. And then she grabs Ravain by the elbow, and he goes, whoa, okay, guess we're going, as she tugs him away. Leo drains his mug of coffee. <sighs> hey, Adra, you want to show me that double brewing thing that you were talking about? you are woken up by sunlight slanting in through the curtains over the window of this guest suite that you are trancing in. There is the slight shifting of weight on the mattress that can only be expected when it is accommodating three people, and you feel the captain flop one arm around your waist and sling a leg over the two of yours. He's totally out, snoring to beat the band. On the other side of you, Sabine is kind of curled up into a ball with her arm hooked through yours, also still out. You're not sure exactly what time it is, but judging by the angle of the sunlight coming in through the gap in the curtains, you can kind of estimate that you have over-tranced by a little bit. What are you doing? I am being as careful as possible trying to get out of bed. <laughs> Roll a stealth check. Natural 18, 21. In some feat of unholy acrobatics, you manage to disentangle yourself from the middle of the captain and Sabine, both of whom are snuggling with you, and get out of this bed without disturbing them. She pauses for a moment to do a victory pose, and then she's gonna head downstairs. Before you go, you see the captain in his trance kind of splay a hand across the empty space on the mattress and make an unsatisfied noise, and then scooch over a little bit and wrap an arm around Sabine. The hallway is pretty quiet when you walk outside. You don't really hear any movement or anything coming from any of the other guest suites. But down on the corner, Arave is sitting on the floor with her knees pulled up to her chest, holding this weird-looking crystal apparatus in her hands. You're too far away to see what's really going on, but there seems to be some kind of image flickering in it, and you hear tinny, distorted yelling coming out of it. 
Erve sighs, pushes her goggles up on her head, and goes, Look, I'm very sorry about your porch furniture, okay? But he's on a high-fiber diet, and he's used to scavenging, so these things happen. Put him on the line. Phineas? Phineas, look at me. (laughs) (laughs) You see Erebe yell at this little image of Phineas in this stone for a minute before making a couple more apologies and sticking it back into her bag. She looks up, sees you, and puts her goggles back down over her eyes. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Sorry to hear that Phineas is terrorizing the babysitter. Where is everyone? Oh, um, well, your brother and his boyfriend are playing handyman for your cousin Adra in the backyard. Lorelai's doing something. Selick is sniffing around Adra's lab. Ravain and Verity went on some kind of sightseeing tour. Not really sure what's going on with that. They were holding hands and kissing a lot. And who am I forgetting? Oh, and Eleonora went to the Australian embassy. Oh, great. Why did she do that before any of us had had time to consult with anyone else on a plan about what to do about this whole situation? I mean, Kalesa showed up with donuts this morning and mentioned that because Eleonora is technically the Queen of Estermuth, that displaying the fact that we had a foreign power on Leo's side might help us with political leverage. I don't really think Eleonora was listening. Kalesa did that thing where she tosses her hair and bats her eyelashes real hard. And, you know, it's not that I blame her. I've short-circuited like that around Kalesa before. Everyone has, but I have so many questions. First of all, Kalesa was here. Second of all, Kalesa's coming up with schemes in this situation and not informing anyone else. Actually, that's not a question. That's par for the course with Kalesa. And third of all, I didn't actually know that you two knew each other that well. We dated for like a year back when we were both at the Order of Iluna. I've been to the palace multiple times. You really don't. Anyway, yes, Kalesa's scheming. We all know this. Yes, she was here. She showed up briefly and then she and Eleonora walked off together. And frankly, I'm not sure of what role I'm playing in all of this yet, so I'm taking the prudent option, sitting down, shutting up, and staying out of the way. I envy you. Have you seen my aunt? She's already digging a little notebook out of her bag and starting to scribble in it. Uh, I think she's in her study. Cool. She's the most experienced with all of this situation out of any of us. I'm gonna see if she has any thoughts. You make your way down this long hallway through the upstairs of the house, and as you near the door to your aunt's study, you overhear the sounds of a conversation coming from inside. You hear the impact of something heavy being slammed down on a desk, and then your aunt's voice supremely frustrated, saying, What do you mean you knew? And then a second, unfamiliar voice replies, Well, I mean, I didn't have concrete evidence, but let's look at the state of affairs. The heir apparent to the throne of a nation dies under mysterious circumstances, precipitating his ambitious younger brother's meteoric rise to power. Some of us have cracked open literally any political intrigue novel ever, Nora, so I was able to infer. You hear the sound of furniture scraping, like someone is standing up from their chair. And then your aunt says, And what? You didn't think to talk to either of your sisters about these suspicions? Boreas, what the fuck? This other voice snorts quietly and goes, (coughs) Since when has anyone in this family talked to each other? I'm gonna be real with you, Nora. I still don't know Jorana's kids' names. I've been starting off their birthday cards with Hey Buddy for the last several decades. (laughs) There is a clatter and multiple squawks of protest from inside this room. I'm going to hesitantly open the door. You open this door to the scene of your aunt with a much smaller Australian elven man in a headlock. He's on the shorter side, very lanky, 
jet black hair, the same bright piercing blue eyes as Nora and your father and Leo all have, and these thick Coke bottle glasses askew on the end of his nose. As you look behind them up to the family portrait that's on the wall, you are able to deduce that this is the older version of the little boy standing next to Nora in the painting that appears to be her twin. Nora pauses, still with him in the headlock, and fixes you with a big, fake smile. Ferora, good morning. You've never met your Uncle Boreas. And then she lets him go and shoves him away a little bit harder than she probably means to. I can come back later if it's a bad time. Your Uncle Boreas apparently pushes his glasses back up on his nose and hurriedly goes, Oh, please don't go! Your Aunt Nora is just glaring daggers at him as he dusts off the front of his clothes. He's dressed very primly. He has like a fussy little cravat on. I would say pleased to meet you, but circumstances are bleak. Nora asked me to come over to see if I could help parse all of this out. I've lived in Vogvoldur longer than she has and pissed off far fewer people. We were just bouncing around ideas about how we're going to approach all of this. Uh, good, good. Fee sits down in one of the chairs. We just need a way to pressure my father to stop all of this. I don't particularly care what happens to him, and I won't argue that Vogvoldur doesn't need to be kept in check. But this is going to lead to needless bloodshed. It already has. Your uncle walks over and sits in the other chair in front of the fireplace, and Nora goes back and sits at her desk. Boreas pinches his lips into a very thin line in an expression you have seen echoed in Nora and your father before, and nods slowly to himself. Well, unfortunately, I don't know anyone who is still breathing who has ever been able to sway Morlin from doing something that he puts his mind to. But undercutting the legitimacy of the war is something that could perhaps be done. We would just have to present the relevant evidence to the Emperor of Vogvoldur. Nora snorts from over at her desk. <laughs> just, okay, all right. I'm gathering that he doesn't take house calls. Your uncle winces a little bit. No, it's more along the lines of a several months long waiting list to have a prayer at getting an audience. I mean, you could attempt to make your case before the Senate, but that's more bureaucracy, more red tape, more time, which I think we can all agree we don't have. No, we don't. Uh, I think we should also try and publicize the fact that Leo and I are alive and opposed to the war as much as possible. I don't know how much sway either of us really has over the people of Asharia, but it has to count for something, given the scale of the military response. Your uncle perches his elbows on the armrests of the chair and steeples his fingers in front of his nose, nodding slowly. Two birds with one stone, then. On a fundamental level, Ferrara, I will be honest with you, Vogvoldur is not that much different from Australia. There's a lot of political pageantry and palm greasing that, frankly, I've always found very boring. But I have dipped my toes in it during my time here. You and Laurel make your grand Valduran political debut, start moving around social functions, gaining allies, and you might be able to get a back door to the Emperor himself. From over at her desk, Nora shakes her head sharply. That's too risky. They can't just be showboating around in public if Valduran operatives don't kill them, Australian ones will. Well, point the first, I don't see what other choice we have. And point the second, at least Leo will have fun politically showboating. It's his favorite hobby. Your Uncle Boreas stands up from his chair and brushes off the front of his waistcoat again. All right, it's settled then. I will start seeing what kind of social engagements we can get you two involved in, and we will pray to Kimrel that you and your brother's political acumen is faster than Morland's itchy trigger finger. 
I have nothing further to offer towards our plans, and I have a book club meeting this afternoon, so Nora, if you don't mind. Your aunt is still sitting at her desk and just fully puts her head in her hands. (sighs) Go. And he turns around and leaves the study. After a long moment, Nora finally looks back up at you. (sighs) All right, well, the vulgar and social scene is not exactly my favorite thing, but I know enough about it to know that you can't be going around to parties in clothes that you have clearly been sleeping and bleeding in for several months. Why don't you go downstairs and find Lark and Adra and tell them that you all need to go shopping? Will do. He gets up, gives a clipped little curtsy, and then leaves the study. Leo, you are outside with your twin cousins, Zed, Lorelai, and Arave. Supposedly, you are all working on the security system. Practically speaking, what this means is everyone but Adra and Zed is sitting in the grass, like the queer kids during gym class in middle school. Adra is calling instructions up where Zed is on a ladder against the roof of the row house. Adra has settled into her chair again, which is why Zed is up on the roof trying to affix runes to it. Lark is redoing a couple of Arave's braids that have gotten a bit loose. Leo lays down on his side in the grass and kind of perches his chin in his hand and calls up to Zed. A little to the left! Zed yells back, You can't even see where I'm at! And then there's a pause, and he goes, Heh. Don't make jokes that you're not planning to give me context to understand. You got no idea what my plans are. Roll me an insight check really quick. 22. Lorelai is sitting out with all of you. She's a little bit apart from where you, Arave, and Lark are all sitting picking at the grass. You watch her hand movements get a little, like, faster and more jerky. And you watch her jaw tense a little bit. And then you hear an ominous wood-on-stone scraping sound. Uh Uh-oh. I turn towards the source of the noise. You turn in time to catch the bottom of the ladder that Zed is standing on scrape across the pavement as it just completely falls out from under him. Zed from up on the roof goes, Whoa! I'm gonna roll a dex check for him. (laughs) Yeah, he's fine. He lurches forward and grabs the gutter as the ladder just clatters to the ground. And he looks down over his shoulder and goes, What the fuck? Leo jumps to his feet and sprints over there and picks the ladder back up so he can get down. What the hell happened? Everybody has kind of gotten up. Erve and Lark have also run over with you. Adra has started wheeling herself across the grass. Lorelai did not get up. You ask what the hell happened, and Zed goes, Fuck if I know, I was just standing on it and it just started moving. Holy shit. You okay? I'm fine, boss. I just, uh, I mean, I've gotten pretty good at landing gracefully, but the prospect of having to practice that skill is always a bit of an adrenaline spike. (sighs) He looks, like, a little bit freaked out. He, like, runs a hand back through his hair. Yeah, okay, enough with the runes for now, I think. Adra, I did want to bring up. Um, I have something that could help out with the security of the house. I'm just wondering how pet-friendly your family is. We do have access to a guard dog, is what I'm saying. There's a pause, and then Lark's head snaps to the side, and they look at you. And Adra goes, oh, Camerol's teeth, here we go. And Lark says, you have a dog? Okay, I'm taking that as a positive reaction, so in that case... Leo up dumps his bag on the floor and a bunch of loose bones come clattering out and he casts Animate Dead and animates Dexter who has been disembodied in his backpack for the entire time. 
You animate Dexter. He bounds to his little wolfy feet, does one of those spectral echoing barks, (laughs) and Lark goes, Oh, I love him. This is Dexter. He's a very good boy, but he will rip the throat out of anybody that tries to hurt any of us, so it's potentially a security benefit. Lark is not listening. Lark has grabbed Dexter by his little head and is sitting on the grass petting him. Adra, from the other side of them, says, Noted. It's not going to be a problem if he gets table scraps for the next infinity meals, is it? Adra, he is made of bones and has no stomach. He's also a dog and Lark has a problem. Zed, from your other side, puts his head in his hands and says, I feel like I'm going to burst a fucking blood vessel. Don't we all, honey? Uh, Lorelai, can I talk to you for a second? You say this, and everybody kind of turns to look at Lorelai, where she's still sitting in the grass and has not reacted to any of this. You watch her rip up a big fistful of grass and then just scatter it at her side and then say, sure thing. And she gets to her feet and just walks past you inside. Leo follows her inside and pulls her into the kitchen or the dining room or whatever room is open. Okay, so I'm gonna lead into this with the fact that I saw that. Lorelai crosses her arms over her chest and looks like she's trying to stare a hole into the floor. You watch her jaw tense again. Saw what? Lorelai, you have known how to cast telekinesis since you were 50. And you weren't subtle about it when you tried to kill my boyfriend just now. My intention was not to kill, only to maim. Maiming people isn't cool either. What has gotten into you? You know Sora never stopped trying to bring you home, right? He died trying to make things right for you, and all that time you were... what? And she gestures towards the backyard. Running around with him? Did you ever actually love him? Of course I did. Leo reaches down and starts fiddling with the engagement ring that's on his finger, looking devastated. I loved him more than anything, and leaving him destroyed me. Losing him destroyed me. I will never be okay again, Lorelai. When you lose someone that you love as much as you and I loved Soren, it takes a piece out of you that you never get back. And you've got two choices. You can fill that hole inside you up with things that make you bitter and hateful. But that only makes the hole bigger, and you have to keep dumping all of that bitterness and hatefulness into it just to stay upright, and eventually it will eat you from the inside out. Or, you can fill it up with things that would make that person proud. And you can get up, and you can keep going. When I broke off my engagement with Soren and left Australia, I was not a good person. Maybe I'm still not. But I am trying to be better, and Zed is helping me be better. I am done with trying to fill up the space Soren left in my heart with things that will only hurt me. I am trying to make him proud. Would he be proud of what you did out there just now? I don't know, because he's not here. And I... And Lorelai throws her hands up, and they are shaking a little bit. And I'm angry! I'm angry all the time! So am I. All the time. And it is okay to be angry, because sometimes anger brings justice when it's focused on the people that deserve it, but... There are people you need to be angry with, Lorelai. Zed is not one of them. The people who made all of this happen, the people that killed Soren, I'm angry with them too. And when the time comes, I am going to make that anger mean something. But until then, I'm not going to misdirect it, and I'm not going to let it make me worse, and neither should you. 
Lorelai opens her mouth to say something. And as she's doing that, Fee whips around the corner into the kitchen with the captain and Sabine on her heels, takes in the situation and says, uh, are we interrupting something? Lorelai, sounding very bitter, says, no. And she just turns on her heel and leaves. Leo finds the nearest chair and just sits down and puts his head in his hands. Sabine kind of cranes her head back around the corner and looks after Lorelai and says, Should someone go talk to her? What's going on? I was engaged to Lorelai's big brother for quite a few years, and he died in a pretty violent way because of me. Sabine winces and interrupts. I I know. I knew Soren pretty well by the end. Leo visibly flinches. Mm. Yeah, she's having some issues with me and Zed. It's a complicated situation. I did fully break things off with Soren before I left Australia, but it just feels pedantic to try to explain it to her at this point. Anyway, please give me any information about anything else that's going on, because I feel helpless and irredeemably shitty in my current situation. Fee, grimacing, says, Well, uh, apparently our surviving uncle is going to try and get us in a position where we can make some political maneuvers vis-a-vis getting the Valduran Emperor on our side, I suppose. Which, distasteful though it may be, seems like the only solution we have. Political maneuvers? Leo drops his hands from in front of his face and perches his chin on his fist. You'll like this too. Lark and Adra are supposed to take all of us shopping for some suitable attire to go to high-class Valduran parties and rub elbows with the relevant people. (gasps) Leo jumps to his feet, looking much more animated than he did before, and goes, Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Alright, you all head to the backyard, and get Lark, Adra, Erve, and Zed, and head out. Fee, you get dragged somewhat against your will into a very elaborate shopping montage. Lark very excitedly leads your party out into the city of Valdur, through the winding cobblestone streets, to a pretty elegant-looking Australian tailor shop. They seem to be on first-name basis with the girl behind the counter. Zed and the captain both seem highly unenthused about the entire situation. Erevé is mostly indifferent as she browses the shelves, but Leo and Sabine both shriek in joy as soon as they walk in and immediately dive into the shelves. Erevé calmly browses the shelf, picks out some nice utilitarian outfits for herself, tight-fitting breeches, nicely trimmed waistcoats. Sabine is more concerned with dressing up the captain and Zed than she is with finding anything for herself. Leo, meanwhile, is already emerging from a fitting room in a very closely fitted, slinky set of Australian formal robes with a slit all the way up to his thigh, and a set of matching stilettos all glimmering under the low light of the shop. He poses very dramatically and goes, Who could say no to this? And then Leo turns over to you, Fee, with a mildly feral expression on his face, grabs you by the shoulder and goes, Okay, we're finding something for you now! Oh, this isn't gonna end well. I go with him. He drags you off through these racks of beautiful garments, richly beaded and embroidered, and stops at a mannequin in the back corner of the shop. He points at it emphatically, which is interesting because this dress is not your style at all. It does have the high collar and long, tight sleeves 
that typically factor into your fashion choices, but it's much tighter and less fluffy than the dresses you usually go for. It's got this long, slinky black skirt. The collar and the sleeves are all made of this very sheer black fabric overlaid with intricate, shimmering black beading all the way down. And the back of this dress dips all the way down. Just big, open back, intricately beaded bodice. Leo grins over at you, still wearing this very high fashion outfit that somehow manages to leave very little to the imagination, and goes, You should go try that on. (laughs) Sure. Uh, She gives him kind of an indulgent look, and then grabs the dress and goes to try it on. You go back, you try it on. The low-cut back of this dress does do quite a lot to expose the silvery white Lichtenberg scars all the way down your back from your incident with the lightning strike. It fits you pretty well. You walk outside. Leo starts a slow clap, and Sabine and the captain both stop what they are doing and gape at you. It's, uh, not something I would usually go for, but... And she kind of rolls her shoulders and pulls her hair back to start braiding it. And she picks the white streak out with her thumb. I think it's a good change. I think it's good for everyone to know exactly where I stand now. The captain, who has a horrendously tied necktie loose around his neck, stares over at you and goes, Do a twirl for us, lass! She laughs, but she does, both hands up, in her hair, do a quick twirl. You see him lean over and whisper something in Sabine's ear, and she smacks him in the shoulder so hard. I'd say share with the class, but I don't want to, and she gestures at Leo, traumatize certain company. She finishes getting her hair in kind of a rough braid picks up her shield, which she left outside of the little changing booth, and says, In any case, I certainly feel ready for whatever comes next. From the doorway of this boutique, Adra goes, I mean, you're all gonna want to change back into your other clothes, because we're not exactly going to any parties tonight. We'll just pack all of this up into garment bags and head back toward the house. I do have one quick stop we need to make before we get home, though. Leo looks deeply sad to have to take his outfit off, but he does go do so and change back into his clothes and carry it out in a garment bag. Yeah, Fee's gonna change back as well. As she's getting the dress packed away, she says, And where are we stopping before we go back to your house? Adra's cheeks darken a little bit. A little local mechanic shop, very charming. They have really good prices and rare supply, though, and I need a couple things for the security system, so... Lark breaks out into a shit-eating grin. What she means to say is that she's gonna go see her girlfriend! Adra's eyes narrow and her head snaps up toward them. I swear to Kimrel, Lark, one more word, you're going in the bubble. And Lark shuts up. The b- doesn't matter. Okay, mechanic shop, cool. Lead the way. You all make your purchases. Lark digs a very large sack of coin out of their bag and pays for all of your new outfits and everything. And then Adra leads your party down through a winding set of streets and alleyways outside, and you end up in kind of a semi-residential, not super populated area of the city at a rundown looking storefront. There is a parking lot riddled with cracked pavement that opens up into three rickety garage doors and a small office with grimy windows, over which there is a sign that says Mancini and Son Mechanics. 
Adra and Lark move confidently towards this office, and Lark pulls open the door, Adra rolls in, are you following her? Fi gives the place a very dubious look, <laughs> but decides to trust her cousins that she's just met, against her own better judgment, and yes, walks inside. Everybody else follows you, your whole group. Lark, Adra, Leo, Zed, Sabine, the captain, Arave, are all very cramped inside this tiny little lobby in this office space. There's no one here. There's a long front desk stretched all the way across the length of this lobby, a lot of handwritten receipts and paperwork scattered across it. Adra frowns boosts herself up out of her chair a little bit and leans over the desk and yells back through an open door into what appears to be the garage area. Hey, Tony! There is a metallic clatter and an amalgam of gnomish cursing from this room off to the side of the office and after a couple more seconds this little gnomish dude comes hustling in he's somewhere in the neighborhood of three feet tall dark hair about jaw length that is slicked back with pomade flat against his skull he's got on a blue heavy-duty cotton shirt with a little embroidered patch on it that says Tony, T-O-N-Y, and a gold chain hanging around his neck. He skids to a halt behind the counter, looks at all of your party gathered there, and then back to Adra and goes, Hey, Adra, what is this little Astraria up in here? What do you want? Adra looks exasperated. I'm looking for a very specific mechanical part, and your cousin. Tony goes, <laughs> and then whips around his shoulder and yells back into the garage, Hey, Tony! Fee squints and says, But isn't he... Adra puts one finger up with extremely rigid posture. Don't ask about it, just trust me. Another few seconds pass, and another gnomish person comes sidling out of the garage. They have straight black hair in a stacked bob that is held back off their forehead with a banana clip. Also have a gold chain around their neck and a blue sturdy shirt with a name tag on it that says Tony, but it is spelled T-O-N-I-I. They have a pair of thick leather work gloves on and kind of brace their hands against the front counter, look over at the first Tony and go, Yeah, boss, what do you need? Tony the first looks over at them and goes, Not you, you putz! All right, I'm deeply unsettled by many of the things that are happening right now. Tony the second, Tony with two eyes, looks over at you and goes, Ah, you and me both, toots. Hey, Adra, you here to see Tony? Adra puts a hand up to her forehead and goes, Yes. And then the new Tony leans back over their shoulder into the garage again and goes, Hey, Tony! A couple more seconds pass, and then this little gnomish lady comes barging her way out of the garage into the lobby. Buzz cut, completely shaved head, just small remnants of dark hair, big doe-like dark eyes, lightly pointed gnomish ears. She is also in a heavy-duty blue cotton shirt with a name tag on it that says Tony, but it is spelled T-O-N-I. She walks in already starting to yell at the other two Tonys and then pauses, swivels her head to the side, sees all of you standing there, but more notably Adra standing there, and kind of scrapes one hand back across her buzz cut. Adra, uh, 
you know, you usually uh, drop me a line when you're thinking of coming by. Uh, Adra, face going darker and darker blue by the second, goes, uh, yeah, I, I, I you know, yeah, uh, the, the, these are my cousins and their various romantic attachments and Arave, who's very cool. Um, I was just in the market for a runic adapter and I thought I would drop by because I know you guys always have the best prices. Tony. Tony with one eye. Tony with the buzz cut. Kind of tilts her head to the side and grins and goes, Ah, come on. You know you're just flattering us so you get a better price. All right, let's see what we got. Come on. And she nods you back into the garage behind the counter. Fee reaches up to pinch the bridge of her nose, nods, and then walks back. Leo and Zed are looking at each other and barely biting back laughter. Sabine and the captain are both absorbed in some other conversation amongst themselves. Erve also looks mildly interested. But you all move back around this counter and into this garage. It is fucking wild. Fee, you have no idea what an automobile looks like. So there are just these massive metal contraptions lifted up on stilts in this garage. Big wheels, rumbling engines, the smell of coal and steam and magic Tony's 1, 2, and 3 followed you out of the lobby but underneath one of these Voldurin contraptions you can see another pair of little gnomish legs dangling out Fee gestures towards this person and says so let me guess that's also Tony the first Tony that you met T-O-N-Y waves vaguely towards this pair of legs dangling out from under this machinery and goes, Eh, well, his real name's Paolo, but we call him Tony because he's just so buff. Show him, Tony! (laughs) (laughs) There is an almighty clatter as this glider slides out from underneath the machinery that Tony, T-O-N-E-Y, as you see on his shirt, was working on. Long, dark hair pulled back in a low ponytail, gold chain around his neck, stands up, flexes his arms, and goes, HA! And he's ripped as hell. Just the buffest gnome you've ever seen. I hate it here. Fee nods to herself, eyes closed, and says, I... Don't know what I expected. We need a runic adapter, apparently. Uh, Tony, T-O-N-E-Y, the very buff one, goes, mm. and goes and starts climbing up the shelves in the back of the garage. Kind of like a cryptid, it's very unsettling to watch. He disappears up towards the ceiling, and there is a very awkward pause, and then he returns with this little metallic part that he very gently places in Adra's lap and then reaches out and presses a hand against the side of her face and kind of pats it. Adra grins and then turns back to what appears to be her Tony, nods very cordially. We appreciate it. I'll catch you up later. We're still on for trivia night down at the pub, right? T-O-N-I, Tony, this little lady with the buzz cut, grins at her and goes, Yeah, totes, even the blockade didn't stop trivia night. You bringing a bunch of fucking weirdos into my shop sure as hell ain't gonna. Offended. Tony looks over and tilts her head at you. Eh, I call him like I see him. I didn't say you were wrong, I just said I was offended. Anyway, lovely to meet you. Should we be getting back? Adra is fiddling with this little mechanical part in her lap and then looks up at a clock hanging on the wall of the garage and goes, Oh god, it's almost our established dinner time. We need to go now. Mom's gonna fucking kill us. Lark! Now! Lark looks panicked and then grabs at the back of her chair, looks up at the clock and goes, Okay, uh, may I? Adra goes, 
in the interest of us not both being grounded for the rest of our lives, yes! And then Lark reaches down to their big clunky goth boots that they have on under their sundress and clicks out a pair of roller skates and just fucking goes. So Lark is using their magical item, the Heelys of Speed, to just shove Adra in front of them and go. They are like 60 feet in front of all of the rest of you. She kind of puts her hands up and goes, I mean, she can't ground us, but I do worry about the two of them and whatever shenanigans they're about to get up to on the way back. So, and then she gestures out the door. Let's go. Leo whips around and puts a hand up. Thank you, Tonys. And then he sprints. He's going. He's using his cunning action to double dash. You all make your way through the streets of Vulder. Lark's heelys of speed give out after about a minute. They keep the wheels out, though. They're just going. But you all drop even with them and Adra by the time you get back to the row house. Fee and the captain and Sabine are being gross as you walk along. And Arave, who is a chronic speedwalker, <laughs> has gotten out ahead of all of you by a little bit. As you've been walking, Zed has reached down to not quite hold your hand, but like lace a couple fingers together. You walk up your Aunt Nora's street and roll perception for me really quick. 25. Dexter's in the front yard. You left him in the back, but he is out front, pacing back and forth on the inside of the gate. And as you walk up, he puts his front paws up on the fence and whines. Leo opens the front gate and walks in and kind of leans down to pet his head. Hey, buddy, what's what's going on? It's okay. Dexter whines again and just like, he does that thing that dogs do where he tries to bury his head in your body as much as he can. Like, he nuzzles up against your stomach and, like, turns his face sideways. Oh, okay, Dexter, cool it. It's okay, bud. Leo looks around at the rest of their party. He's being weird. We should go inside. Arave had, like, paused on the front steps as you fussed over the dog, and she says, well, that bodes terribly. And she's going to open the door, step inside. Uh, two questions. Are you going and are you taking Dexter? Yes to both of those questions. You all move inside kind of as a cluster. Dexter is glued to your leg. You walk inside and you hear the sound of something shatter against a wall. And your Aunt Nora yells, Get out of my house, Morlin! Leo immediately whips back around to look at Fee and whispers, Oh, fuck! Fee took a step back when she heard that, and she has her fingers pressed to the base of her throat, looking wide-eyed in the direction of your aunt's voice. From the sitting room, you hear your father's voice. Nora, I know you've always had issues with authority, but you would do well to remember to whom you speak. And Nora fires back, I speak to my least favorite sibling! And there's another smashing sound. You hear your father gasp and go, hurtful. Nora yells back, oh, I'm sorry. Did I hurt your feelings? I know, why don't you go tell Val about it? Oh, wait. Smash. Are they still in the sitting room? As far as you can tell, they are in the sitting room. Yeah. Leo looks over at Fee and says, Do you have your wand? What? Yes, but... I have a plan, and I don't have time to explain it. Give me your wand. What the hell do you mean you have a plan? 
Look me in the eyes and tell me that we are going to run from this. Give me your wand, Fee. Fee pulls her wand out of the holster on her hip and hands it to you. Leo reaches down to his belt and pulls Kimrel's blade out of its holster. He tries to act like he's fussing around with it, but as he does so, he's going to cast a message cantrip to Sabine. Telepathically, he says, I am about to do something really, really stupid. I need you to not let Fee or Zed stop me. And if it goes bad, I need you to promise me that you're going to get them out of here. This is our crisis deadline. You meet Sabine's eyes. And for just a second, this look of horror and shock flashes across her face. And then it is gone. And she replies, Understood. Do what you have to do. Leo reaches down to his bracer and zaps Kimrel's blade into it. And then takes Fee's wand in his dominant hand stands outside the door of the sitting room and waits. You hear another slash. And then your father says, Nora, I don't have time to deal with you acting like a petulant child. I'm here to see my children. And the door opens. Leo does his best to move fully in front of Fee. Your father stands in the doorway. Nora is behind him, clearly winding up to throw another teacup at a wall. She stops, looking at all of you in absolute terror. And your father starts to smile. Hello, children. You're late. Let's talk. And that is where we're going to wrap on season two. I feel like I'm going to be fucking sick. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling whatever comes after hysteria. <laughs> what in the fuck is going on? We'll find out next time. On Cabell Duel. Hey everybody, Barry here with the postscript. That sure was a season, huh? Anyway, you can find us on social media on Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok at Compelled Duel. We also have a lot of other cool stuff available, like an official website, an official Spotify profile. You can find all of that stuff linked on our various social media pages. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, we ask that you consider heading on over to patreon.com slash compelled duel, where starting at just $2 a month, you can get all kinds of cool perks like early access to episodes, access to exclusive Spotify playlists and bonus content, and even handwritten letters from your favorite character every month. Speaking of Patreon, thank you so much to our newest patron, Catherine Mitosh. Thanks so much for your support. If you're interested in supporting us in ways other than pledging to the Patreon, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcast, we ask that you consider leaving us a rating and a review because that helps us get promoted to a wider listener base and helps us grow our audience. And as always, we rely very heavily upon word of mouth advertising. So if you're enjoying the show, we just ask that you tell a couple friends about it. And if they like it, ask them to tell a couple friends as well. And now comes the kind of sad part. We are going on hiatus for a little bit while we plan and record the first part of the final season of our first campaign. But not to worry, there will be plenty of fun bonus content for you to interact with while we are gone. We will have lots of character playlists going up on the official Spotify. If you're a member of our Patreon, we will have several bonus episodes going up. We're going to be posting our first public bonus episode around the holidays. Lots of stuff is coming. 
And as far as season three, you can look for that to go live on Friday, December 17th, 2021. However, if you are a member of our Patreon, you'll be getting access to that on Thursday, December 16th at 9 a.m. PST. Or if you'd like to join us on our YouTube channel for the live premiere of the season, that will be going up on Thursday, December 16th at 5 p.m. PST. Here we go, y'all. We'll see you soon.